Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story and I hope you're all doing wonderfully today. Thanks for um, tuning in. I am so excited to introduce our special guest for today, um, Marty, who's joining us to share her incredible myeloma story. Marty, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. You know, uh, Marty, before we get started, um, I always love to ask people to just introduce themselves a little bit, because as we know, and this is so important, we are so much more than a cancer diagnosis, which mm -hmm. we're going to learn a lot about today. But outside of that, I'd love to know more about Marty. Could you tell us about, about you and, and anything you'd like people to know? I am a wife. Um, I'll be celebrating 33 years in September. And I am a mom of two daughters, and I have seven grandchildren, um, all from the ages of 10 all the way down to three. Uh, six months he is. Yeah, Ezra is six months. So um, so I have um, I have a full plate with my family. And so and I I love I love my grandkids. So that's one of my favorite pastimes to do is to spend time with them and my daughters. It's the best thing ever. It really is. Um, sometimes you you just appreciate and have so much fun with your kid than what you did with your kids um, because everything is so much more serious with your kids. But with your grandkids, you can just go and have some fun. That's right. You're like the fun the fun grandma. You can spoil them, do the things, and then they go home. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You can feed them the candy. That's right. I say my mom is definitely more of a favorite than I am as a mom. So, <laughs> um, yeah. perfect. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd love to dive right in now into your story about how this all started. And I know it was very recent, mm -hmm. um, and you sent me your timeline. So I was able to see, you know, some of your experience. So thank you for that. But this started really in January of last year. So in 2020, mm -hmm. Um, and before all this COVID craziness hits, really, you're feeling exactly. these first symptoms, right, Marty? And there, you said dizziness, foggy brain, vomiting, and then you go through all of these, I mean, from January all the way through summer, I mean, you're going to so many appointments. So I'd love for you to bring us into that part of your experience. What were those first symptoms and how you navigated, you know, this whole balance of I'm feeling these things in my body, but going to the doctors, it's not quite matching up. I ended up having um, some of the symptoms I ended up having were I had some extreme dizziness and some fogginess. I think at times I had some confusion um, and um, just all in all fatigue. And I just constantly that fatigue was always there. Um, and so and then I started having some episodes of vomiting. Um, and all of a sudden the whole room would start spinning out of the blue. And so I'm like, man, this is so unusual. And, um, I'd have to run to the bathroom. There's a few times I have had to leave work and then I just had an extreme migraine with it. So I, I didn't know what was going on. So, um, when it happened, it started to happen weekly. And when it happened, every week for three or four weeks, that third time I decided I was going to make a doctor's appointment because something was off for sure. And so that is when I had my first uh, blood draw, um, just to see what was going on and see if there was anything unusual. And there wasn't, except that my thyroid was just a little bit off. We decided to go ahead and wait on taking any medication and, um, then just kind of went back to regular life, still felt all of those symptoms, even though the vomiting had stopped. Um, I went ahead and um, my next symptom that I had was the hives. And that started more in the spring and um, had them all over my forehead, kind of in my eyes, all over my face. And, um, that was the only place I had hives. Um, so I thought, oh my goodness, what am I, what is going on here? So again, I went back to the doctor and I asked her if 
that could be a result of my thyroid. And she said, no, she goes, you probably are allergic to something. Let's go ahead and have you see an allergist. And so she gave me, um, you know, steroids and all of the stuff for hives and sent me on my merry way. All of that kind of, all of that kind of cleared up. And I got a referral to, um, an allergist and, um, went ahead and kind of delayed that because the, they would kind of come and go, they wouldn't stay consistent. And then I went ahead and again, they came back. And so at that time I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to this allergist. So I went to that allergist and he ended up being, um, an environmental allergist Mm. instead of a food allergist. And so I was thinking I must have some sort of a food allergy. (laughs) And I know you go to the allergist twice, but all the while, did you start to feel these other symptoms too? You you know, like the racing heart, coughing, runny nose, short of breath, fevers, extreme fatigue. Did that all start happening pretty quickly after the hives as well? No, that did not start until September. Um, So this was kind of in the spring and throughout the summer and, um, except for one trip, I did have one trip to the emergency room with my hives because they had gotten so bad. Um, and, um, the doctor says, I am not an allergist (laughs) and he ends up sending me home. And I was like, I understand that. I said, but I need some sort of relief. And the only way I can get relief is by coming to you because it's a Sunday. (laughs) And so we went ahead and did that. And but none of the other uh, COVID type symptoms, because that's what they kept telling me I had, did not start until the end. Uh, um, the end of the fall um, is when it started. Okay. On that, gosh, it, it must have been frustrating because you're like, I'm trying to get relief here, and then I'm getting sent over here, and they're telling me to go back over here. Yep, yeah. yep, that was it. Was very, very frustrating, and it actually made me want to not go back to the doctor. <laughs> you know, it made made me just think, oh, it's just in my head. I will get better. I'm going to feel better. I'm just going to rest because I'm just so tired. I'm so fatigued. If I could just get enough rest springtime, you're seeing the allergists, there are these hives, they're not getting resolved. Um, You do eventually start going to the doctor, both in person and virtually. Talk to us about about that, summarize it. Yeah. Um, So with COVID, most of us know, most of us have usually went to the Zoom meetings for the doctors if we had went. And so my first meeting was a Zoom meeting with the doctor and she diagnosed me with bronchitis. And I was like, oh yeah, this makes sense. I kind of feel like that's what I have. And in fact, that's what I told her. It's like, I think I just have bronchitis. You know, I've had that before. That's what it feels like. And, um, went on the antibiotic and, but did not feel better after the antibiotic and the inhaler. And so the next time I, um, went to, um, an urgent care and decided to go ahead and see them in person. And I told them my symptoms. And at that time, that's when I started having the racing heart (laughs) and the, the erratic heart rate. And they're like, are you anxious about anything? And it's like, well, I guess I am. I just, I just don't feel good. (laughs) You know, it's like, that's why I'm here. And so, um, that's when they did x-rays and they said, Hey, you have pneumonia, not bronchitis. So another round of antibiotics and a new inhaler that I could have more frequently. And, um, then I kind of would bounce back and forth between the vert about once a week, I would contact them and I would either go in virtually or I do a virtual visit with them. And at that point, I was just wanting reassurance that I was going to get better. So that's why I kept in communication with them. And then also concerned again about it being COVID and possibly people, you know, me spreading COVID. <laughs> and so um, that, that's how I kept on going back and forth. And I did that several, several times. I yeah. think I had maybe six visits, I think. 
Yes, I saw there was like three in person, three virtual. Yeah. yeah. All together, you also had three ER visits. Yeah which I do want to get to this point where you're finally like realizing, I mean, I know that COVID was in the mix. You were diagnosed with anemia and all these other things during these mm-hmm. ER visits, but in November you were finally admitted to the hospital. And I do kind of want to highlight this part of it. First of all, I wanted to ask you, um, when did you, did you ever realize this is, I'm dealing with more than well, it's not bronchitis, it's not pneumonia, and it's not like, it, maybe COVID was in the mix at some point, but when did you know, did you ever know before the official diagnosis that something yes. wasn't quite right? Yeah, you, you did. I knew some, probably at the very start of November, um, which um, I didn't end up going to the hospital until the end of November, end of November, um, but the very first part of November, I'm like thinking, why am I not getting better? And why am I so fatigued? Um, I had started towards the beginning of November where I'd be at work and then I would come, I would go for my lunch hour. And instead of eating my lunch, I literally would sleep in my, my vehicle because I was so exhausted. And that's when I knew it's like, man, it's like, why do I feel like I cannot function right now? Um, and that's, that's the bottom line is I knew that I wasn't functioning very well. Um, we had some family things that had happened in the beginning part of November that also made me think, oh, this is probably just stress. I'm just dealing with a lot of stress because of my, our family issue that we were dealing with. And I'm just fatigued because, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not sleeping the best at night and, you know, and that's, that's why, you know, I got this on my mind. I got to get this off of my mind. And that was kind of the issue that I, um, kept on having. And then finally, um, I told my, I told my husband, his name is Michael. And I said, Michael, I said, something is really wrong. I'm thinking that maybe I need to go to the ER. And he's like, okay, let's go to the ER. Um, unfortunately at that time he ended up having COVID. Um, (laughs) and so we had been socially distancing for one or two days already. So his brother ended up taking me to the ER and I don't really want to go into what happened at the ER, but, um, there was only one bed left because of COVID and that ambulance came (laughs) and I'm like, I'm never going to get into the hospital. (laughs) And so at that point I decided I'm just going to go ahead and leave (laughs) and go on home. And, um, you know, you have that opportunity because I hadn't checked in yet. I was, I was waiting outside, waiting for them to allow me to go in um, because those restrictions were so tight and they had so many cases at that time. Um, I ended up just saying, I'm going to go on home. And my brother-in-law said, well, do you want me to take you to the other hospital that's next to us? At that point, I was just angry. (laughs) I was angry and frustrated that I said, I just want to go home and eat. And then I'm going to go to bed. And that just get some rest. Just you're done with it. You're like fed up. I mean, physically not feeling well. And then obviously encountering all this must have been so frustrating. Um, But I I saw that just the next day is when, I mean, you had to go back (laughs) to the ER, right? And And then they admitted you into the hospital. And at what point, you know, I know there are the usual tests and everything. At what point um, did the doctors finally start to think, oh, wait a minute. Okay. This is not, we're not, this is not the COVID bucket. This is something Mm -hmm. else. Actually, my husband is very, is very good friends with the hospitalist doctor that was in our area. And he that morning that I went into the hospital, he, because I was like a gray ash (laughs) color, um, he called that doctor because like I said, they were good friends. And he said, something is wrong with my wife. I think my wife is dying. And he goes, and I'm going to bring her in. And at that point, 
I went ahead, but that morning I had told him, I said, something is terribly wrong. And I do feel like I am dying. Something is terribly wrong. And I said, I need you to mask up, even though you have COVID and I need you to take me to the ER because I'm not going by ambulance. (laughs) And so, uh, he did and he stayed in contact with that doctor. And so when I arrived at the hospital, honestly, if I have to say I had the, a special treatment, I did. They were, they, I did not have to sit. I had people in my room constantly. They were on top of it. They were, the doctors were in and out during that time period. So I did not have to wait very long. My blood work was done. Everything was just right in order. So I was very, very fortunate for that. And within, within the first half hour, they knew that I was anemic and that I was, I was bleeding from somewhere internally. And at that point, that is when, um, I did my first blood transfusion, um, was in the ER and then they wanted to do another one. Um, at that point, my, I think my blood, my hemoglobin was at, um, 5.8, which is rather low. And, um, and that's kind of, I did get a special treatment with at the hospital, which I was really thankful for. Yeah. No. So, I mean, honestly, Mm -hmm. that's sometimes how, how you you get that extra attention. And and for you, that was really great news because you've been dealing with this for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, They had to do these blood transfusions. You know, you said there were three given throughout the day. Mm -hmm. There was heart monitoring, EKG, chest x-rays. And then eventually by the end of all this, you had a sonogram or you had an ultrasound done, a bone marrow biopsy Mm -hmm. and a, a, a CT scan. Yeah. Um, when during this part of the process, were you like, okay, you know, did you start to get an inkling of, did cancer ever enter your mind? I mean, was there ever a point where you can point back and say, ah, that was when Mm -hmm. I think when it entered my mind was right after the ultrasound. And because there was not anything that pointed to me having a bleeding source at that time. Um, I am not a person who ever has stomach issues. So they had been prepping me for maybe a colonoscopy and an endoscopy, but I didn't have any stomach issues. So I'm like thinking when the ultrasound came back and everything was normal, I kind of knew, especially when they said they were going to do a bone marrow biopsy that's when I definitely kind of suspected, um, that it was, it was cancer. And in fact, my daughter and I finally, my oldest daughter and I finally had an open conversation about, Hey, she says, Hey mom, do you think it's cancer? And I'm like, you know, I think it is. And I said, I don't know what kind of cancer I said, but I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna, it's the elephant in the room. So let's just, I'm just going to straight be a straight shooter and ask them about it. And so, um, that's how we kind of figured, we kind of started down that path that it had to be cancer. And that was all during, is you were in the hospital at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so was this over the phone that you were talking to your doctor? I mean, sorry, your daughter. Yes. I was yeah. on the phone talking to my daughter because at again, you know, it's COVID COVID. at that time, the regulations are no visitors at all. And especially because I was a close contact exposure. Um, so they were treating me as a close contact exposure since my husband had had it. Um, and even though we had been distancing ourselves, Um, you know, he had, and we masked going into the hospital. He still, I mean, I still was exposed. So, um, you're your oldest daughter. She's, you know, grown adult and she's like, mom, there's this, you know, let's let's just talk Mm -hmm. about this. How did you approach having that first conversation? Cause I know it can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just saying the word yourself, right. But then opening it up to the family, how did you uh, navigate that? Well, she is. Um, so I usually talk to her every day and when I didn't started not getting better, um, 
she was getting very concerned. And um, in fact, she was the one was like, mom, did you go in and get COVID tested? And she's um, a nurse. And so she's just very proactive in the medical field. And so she just wanted me to be cautious. And then when I wasn't getting better and getting better, she was getting concerned because um, every time I would talk to her on the phone, you know, I'd have a coughing attack or I'd get short of breath or, you know, I, I just had to let her go because I needed to lay down. And she's like, mom, something is just not right. You need to, you, you need to go to the doctor and take care of yourself. So I think at that point we had exhausted and she knew that I had been going to the doctor pretty much every week or every two weeks at that point and not getting an end result. Um, and so at that point, it was almost an easy conversation. It was a, it was a place where it was like, yeah, we need to look at, we need to look at this because something is definitely not correct. And okay. so, um, and that conversation, uh, was a little bit harder with my husband having that conversation. What was that like? Uh, he, it was, so once I was diagnosed, um, I had the nurse practitioner, um, who was going to contact my daughter and then the doctor, the hospitalist, who's my husband's good friend was going to contact my husband, but he wanted to have his plan in place before he contacted my husband. And so I was still kind of processing. So I wanted them to kind of share that though, that news. Um, and it ended up being where, um, the doctor, the nurse practitioner called my daughter and they had a good conversation, but the doctor hadn't called Michael yet, my husband. And so I ended up telling him, and that was where we both, uh, we both cried. And, um, and then he also, um, usually responds in anger. <laughs> That's his first response. So he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? Um, and so he, he, and he was just, he was just mad. And then he's got COVID and he's feeling miserable. So it was, just, <laughs> and I can understand why he was so angry. Um, but I think he was just angry at, yeah, just everything. It had been, it had been a rough couple of months there before diagnosis. Thank you so much for sharing that, Marty. I, I really appreciate all the context because those are all the human details, right? It's not just yeah. a diagnosis in a vacuum. It's, yeah. well, there's a diagnosis and we had these family things happening earlier that month and my husband had COVID and our family's involved and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot on your plate already. Um, so actually let's rewind a little bit then because you're getting all these tests done. Can you describe that moment you found out about the diagnosis? Um, just that moment. And I mean, if you remember what you were thinking, what you were feeling, um, especially mm -hmm. cause this is during COVID and you're by yourself. That was probably the hardest is just being by myself. And, um, man, when you hear that news you kind of want to have someone there to hold your hand. And, um, and so I just remember feeling very alone. And then also when you don't feel good, you just can't get it together. <laughs> you know, you just can't get it together. So both the doctor and the nurse practitioner were in, in the room and, um, I'm going to rewind real quick. When I went to have my cat scan, I had a little issue with, um, the dye, the drink that they gave me. And this was how we figured out that I had multiple myeloma. So it's pretty important. Uh, it's in pretty, it's a pretty important factor. So I was starting to have some issues with the drink. And I started feeling like hives and itchy all around my mouth. And so um, we decided, um, the nurse practitioner decided, hey, you know, we don't have to be in a hurry to get this CAT scan with the dye. Let's go ahead and back off. Let's give you some Benadryl and then um, get, give that a little bit of time to set up, settle in your system. And then we'll take you on down and we'll get the CAT scan. 
Um, so they did the first um, shot of Benadryl and I reacted fine. Um, the second shot of Benadryl um, basically caused me to not be able to breathe. And so uh, it was just like everything closed in on me. And so they did a code. I did not code or anything, but they called a code just on the, to be on the safe side. And they, um, they just took care of me and everything was fine. And um, so I'm finally um, situated back into my room <laughs> after all of that happened. And um, the first thing I did once I was settled was I Googled, <laughs> and I know that's the worst thing to do, but I Googled a Benadryl reaction to, to see what came up and it said cancer. So that reaction was specific to a blood cancer. And so when they came in, it was the doctor and the nurse practitioner, they came in at this, that time, I do have to say, we had become very close. My daughter had a relationship with a nurse practitioner. My husband had a relationship with the hospitalist. There's constant communication, I think, behind the scenes with my husband and my daughter talking to them, plus me. So even though... Um, I got the diagnosis myself. We still, everyone was still a, very much a part of that conversation, even though it wasn't all at once. Um, everybody was in the loop. Everybody was a part of that and made me feel so I was not alone at that point. And so then when they went ahead and um, had that bone marrow um, biopsy, they went ahead and um, made sure that that got done and, and, and they had the preliminaries. And then that's when they said, and that was 48 hours. And usually it takes, I want to say it takes about four days for them to get the full report. And, but at that point they could do, um, a preliminary and it was multiple myeloma. And so they did come in and tell me, and it was just, like I said, the hardest part was just being alone and not being able to hold my family's hand. And then later on, I was able to ask questions and process things with them. And, you know, the human side of things is I bawled like a baby. <laughs> it was so emotional. And, and then you're also at the same time, what does this mean? I don't, I have never even heard of this blood cancer never even heard of it. I've heard of, um, leukemia and I've heard of lymphoma and I've heard of non Hodgkin's, but I'd never heard of multiple myeloma. Yeah. It's a surreal moment, right. Mm -hmm. For you where you're like, okay, I get this is cancer, but also what, what am I dealing with here? What is this? Um, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you sharing the, the human side of things, right. That it was incredibly emotional. Um, and of course being by yourself, you know, making it so much worse, right? I mean, you didn't have to right. your loved ones around you. Um, well, on that note, and I know you did talk about um, your conversation with your daughter when cancer was sort of like, oh, okay, maybe this is what we're dealing with. And then with your husband, in general, when did you start thinking about how am I going to like share with the people in my life? You mm -hmm. know, how did you approach that? Uh, because that can be like a full-time job, <laughs> right? Is informing people, like, do you have any guidance for anyone else about what you did that was successful, what you wish you would have done to conserve energy for yourself? Because I had went into the hospital, um, you know, one thing that social media does is social media is a powerful tool to get the communication out to people. And we have a really strong faith community and so we actually posted, um, the first thing I did was I had just shared a social media post saying that I am in the hospital and I had to get some blood and we don't know what the bleeding source is and that we instantly had amazing response from people. And of course we told our immediate family first, you know, like our parents and, and, um, and so, uh, 
just each one of us ended up doing that. And then when I posted that, that was when, um, that was when we were able to tell our friends and our family. And then, so they knew that at that point that I was in the hospital and I told them I would keep them posted on what was going on. And so social media for us was a big, was a big deal. Actually, it was a big deal to get people praying and it was a big deal to get people um, informed with what was going on. What you figured out worked for you well. So I'm glad to hear yeah. that. Um, was there anything at that point? Um, I mean, usually, right, for people who are diagnosed, you're not really processing. <laughs> and like, how much processing can you do? But was there anything that you wish you um, would have asked? You know, because you said you had an opportunity to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know, again, that it was different because of COVID. So it's not like you could have another set of eyes and ears during mm -hmm. those conversations, which sometimes people say, yeah, just have more people in the room with you because there's so mm -hmm. much information coming at you. But did anything else help you? Um, and yeah, do you have any questions you wish you would have asked or any advice for people who are dealing with this part of the experience? I, it's, that's a tough question because part of me was very, actually, I was very, very sick at the time with um, all of these other symptoms with the dizziness um, I had this swooshing in my ear. <laughs> and so when I'm talking to people, I'm hearing the swooshingness all the time. Um, I'm in a place where I am not able to walk because when I get up to walk, I feel very dizzy and faint. Um, and, and really that just as a symptom, because I didn't have any, uh, enough blood, <laughs> I was very low on blood with anemia. And so I do, you know, it's hard to say, Hey, this is what I wish I would have done at that point. I was just, I just wish I would feel better. <laughs> um, and so even though I have this diagnosis on my plate, I feel alone, and I'm struggling in that aspect on what I'm going to do um, and what I'm going to say and what I'm going to ask. Um, if it wasn't for my daughter giving me some of the questions to ask, um, and then I would speak those into my phone as a reminder. So that when they came back in, I would remember to ask them because I would forget very easily. Um, so she was the one that was asking. And then um, I also, that's the reason why I had the nurse practitioner call my daughter is so that she could ask all the questions. And then kind of later on, we could talk about it later um, when I felt better. 